Good morning, everyone. I'm Joanne Myers, Director of Public Affairs Programs. And on behalf of the Carnegie Council, I'd like to welcome our members, guests, and C-SPAN Book TV to this Public Affairs Breakfast Program. It is our privilege to be hosting two of our nation's leading First Amendment scholars, Lee Bollinger, President of Columbia University, and Jeff Stone, the Edward D. Levy Distinguished Service Professor at the University of Chicago. I believe you received copies of their bios when checking in, which I hope you'll take a moment to read if you haven't done so already. Together, they will be discussing the free speech century. This co-edited volume of essays commemorates the 100th anniversary of the US Supreme Court's decisions interpreting the First Amendment's guarantee that Congress shall make no law abridging the freedom of speech or of the press. Although the words drafted in 1789 seemed plain enough, it wasn't until 1919, in response to the government's harsh repression of World War I critics, that Justice Holmes laid the foundation for our nation's robust protection of free speech. When he wrote that, speech can only be suppressed when the government can demonstrate a clear and present danger of harms the government has a right to prevent. It's important to point out that with this ruling, Schenck versus the United States, the Supreme Court recognized that the principles of the First Amendment were formed against the background of a profound national commitment <coughs> to the principle that debate on public issues should be uninhibited, robust, and wide open, and that it may well include vehement, caustic, and sometimes unpleasantly sharp attacks on government and public officials. In free speech century, our speakers have gathered many of our nation's leading constitutional scholars, familiar names such as Lawrence Tribe, Lawrence Lessig, and Cass Sunstein, among others, to reflect on the history of the First Amendment as it has been interpreted in the courts and in our society. In covering not only the past, critiquing controversial issues of the present, and anticipating the future in this age of the internet, social media, and the globalization of speech, they look at how principles of free expression have been embraced, modified and pursued, both in the United States and around the world. It's now 100 years since freedom of speech in America became a reality rather than just an ideal, and still we are witnessing serious challenges to the First Amendment. One could argue that there is no better time than now to affirm the bold experiment begun by our forefathers so long ago and remind us about why the First Amendment's protection of free speech and expression is central to the concept of the American political system and our democratic institutions. Please join me in giving a very warm welcome to two of our nation's leading academics, Lee Bollinger and Jeff Stone. Thank you for joining us. So one of the things that's important to understand is that when the Supreme Court first addressed the meaning of the First Amendment in 1919, um, the court unanimously upheld the convictions of individuals for criticizing World War I and the draft. And even Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes uh, and Louis Brandeis, who went on to be heroes of free speech, uh, were part of that unanimous uh, court. Uh, and so the commitment that we today have to free speech, if, if somebody said today uh, we should prosecute someone for criticizing a government policy, for saying it's a bad idea, because it might lead some people to, if they're persuaded that it's a bad idea to engage in undesirable conduct, we would say that's completely inconsistent with the First Amendment. But it's important to know that when the court first addressed these questions, that's the position they took. And it wasn't until several months later that Justice Oliver Wendell Holmes began writing dissenting opinions, arguing to the contrary. But basically, it took the court half a century to get to the point where it fully endorsed the positions taken by Holmes and Brandeis in their dissenting opinions in that era. Um, so this, the story of, of the uh, evolution of free speech doctrine in the United States is one of a long struggle um, in which the court had to learn from its own mistakes and ultimately come to the point of giving a robust protection to free speech, uh, which was not part of the initial understanding of the First Amendment. Uh, so Lee, do you want to add something to that? Um, so, I mean, Jeff has stated, the, I think, the basic... Uh, it, sort of the fundamental purpose behind the book. So most people, if you ask them, freedom of speech, freedom of the press in America, you know, how long has that been developed? Most people would think it's like the beginning of the country. It's, it's back in the 18th century. Uh, 
And the, anybody like Jeff and me who's devoted our lives to, uh, to this subject, uh, and we really came of age in the time, that is the 1960s, when freedom of speech and press, as we know it today, was really conceived of, in a sense, in a powerful sense. We know that the very first cases uh, in the Supreme Court of the United States, and it's the Supreme Court cases over time that really define free speech, and free press. There was not a single free speech case in the Supreme Court until 1919. And then, as Jeff said, it took them 50 years in the Supreme Court to develop the array of cases and decisions and holdings that we take today as the core of the American idea of freedom of speech and press. So that is an astonishing thing. And you can say a number of things about this. Uh, uh, it's a mistake to take it for granted. Uh, I mean, across the political spectrum today, conservatives and liberals generally agree on free speech and free press in the United States. Now, I'm not talking about uh, President Trump, whom I think has a, a different view of this. If he were unleashed on the First Amendment, I think we'd have a very different First Amendment. But in the Republican Party generally, and the Democratic Party, there's, more, there's really quite a bit of unanimity. Different reasons, different rationales, but it's a very different situation from abortion and Roe versus Wade, other areas. How did that happen? How do we go from 1919 and what Jeff described as those decisions, which were really of a completely different mentality to today? And to emphasize the different mentality of 1919, as Jeff said, the three decisions that all came together all involved people who had just criticized the draft of the war, were convicted, and the Supreme Court of the United States unanimously, with the great Oliver Wendell Holmes Jr. writing the opinion for the court, upheld the convictions. And one of those cases involved a candidate for President of the United States, Eugene Debs, head of the Socialist Party. He gave a speech in Ohio in which he praised people who had resisted the draft. Absolutely protected speech in today's world. Prosecuted, convicted, and the Supreme Court affirms the conviction. I mean, this is the kind of thing you hear about in, in Turkey, in other countries uh, around the, the world. Uh, so how do we go from there to here? And we wanted to try to bring together people who would help us understand that. Um, one interesting aspect of free speech today is, as Lee said, there's this agreement on the part of both liberals and conservatives, uh, jurists and uh, academics and lawyers, that free speech is really important. Um, Yet, the way that plays out is sometimes surprising. And one example of a contemporary issue where that has happened is on the issue of campaign finance. Um, traditionally, liberals have been much more supportive of free speech than political conservatives, uh, whether it's about criticism of the war during the First World War or whether it's about the communist era. Um, it's generally been with the anti-Vietnam War uh, movement it, it's generally been liberals who've been fierce defenders of free speech, and conservatives have been more cautious about it. Um, but at the present time, in, in w at one level, both of them have endorsed free speech. But there are these anomalies where we now find some cir circumstances where political conservatives or judicial conservatives are more fiercely defending free speech than liberals. And as I said, campaign finance is an excellent example of this. So for conservative justices, and this divides very neatly between Republican appointed justices and Democratic appointed justices, and generally liberal and generally conservative justices. So on campaign finance reform issues like Citizens United, um, what one finds is that the conservative justices take a, a very aggressive approach in protecting the First Amendment and saying that for the government to, to limit the amount that corporations or individuals can spend in order to promote the views that they believe to be important in the political and democratic system um, by saying that they can only spend a certain amount to support those positions is a direct defiance of the principle of free speech. 
and that tell somebody you've spoken enough, shut up and sit down, is completely incompatible with the principle of free speech. Whereas the more liberal justices have taken the position that we have to look at the democratic system more broadly. And we have to ask, um, is there a danger that a small segment of our population, because of their accumulation of enormous wealth, is able to distort the system by spending huge amounts of money, um, wildly disproportionate to their representation as people, um, and therefore to manipulate the political process in a way that's completely incompatible with the ultimate goals of the First Amendment, which they would say are not so much to give each person the right to speak as much as he or she wants, but to produce a democratic system that operates in a functioning and appropriate manner. The conservative justices will respond that it's not that simple. Because one of the things we've learned over time, from 1919 to the present, is that we cannot trust public officials when they regulate speech. They will say they are regulating speech for a valid reason, when their real motivation is something else entirely. So to go back to the World War I cases, um, what the public officials said is, well, we are silencing people who criticize the war and the draft because we need to win this war. And we can't afford to have people refuse it, uh, service in the military or to be insubordinate or not buy war bonds. If we're going to win this war, we cannot have people uh, acting in ways that are inconsistent with the war. And therefore, we have to stop people from criticizing the war because that will lead to this bad behavior. One of the things the court came to understand is that the real motivation behind these laws against criticizing the war in the draft was not so much the impact it would have on the ability to actually fight the war, but people don't like being criticized. And the Wilson administration didn't want people saying, we don't think you're fighting the right war. We don't think you, people should be dying over this, and therefore putting in jeopardy their re-elections. And so once and so conservatives today on the, on the campaign finance issue will argue, we can't allow campaign finance because just as in the World War I cases, the people in favor of campaign finance say they're doing it to promote our democracy. But what they're really doing is trying to restrict speech that is inconsistent with their political positions. And therefore, we should be distrustful of that. And so it, put, it poses a really interesting dilemma in terms of how we, how we continue to rethink these questions that are with us from the very beginning. So Jeff has uh, you know, very succinctly and, and beautifully condensed the argument about campaign finance laws. And this is, as he indicates, one of the most contested areas of contemporary uh, freedom of speech uh, jurisprudence. Uh, we have some essays uh, on this uh, in the book, which are you know, one by Floyd. And uh, these are really uh, important um, uh, thoughts. But Jeff has really nicely uh, uh, put that uh, before you. I make a couple of comments. One is, so. We went from this 100 years, and it's really the last 50, beginning, I think, with New York Times versus Sullivan, which laid out this idea that freedom of speech and press is premised on the fact that we live in a democracy. And if you live in a democracy, you must have the citizens be able to discuss public issues. And the government can't intervene and say what's right or wrong. And from that, it says you can't have libel laws that uh, try to protect the reputations of, of uh, government officials unless certain things, um, you know, actual malice, extremist speech, the neo-Nazis, uh, the Klan in Ohio, the neo-Nazis in Skokie, protected speech, uh, people who come up and say terrible things to another person, fighting words, you can only punish that in the event that it's a face-to-face -face encounter, deeply personal, offensive to the, the average person would respond, narrow that <coughs> exception, narrow the libel exception, the um, uh, obscenity laws that have been around for so many decades, narrow that, narrow that, you can't, okay, so you, Pentagon Papers, the press, you can publish, what, case after case after case establish this, uh, this doctrinal structure that uh, we live with today. But then within that, there are profound disagreements. Campaign finance uh, is one of the most prominent. 
What that reveals, as Jeff described it, you could send, you could hear two different philosophies about freedom of speech and press. One philosophy is what free speech and free press in the Constitution of the United States are all about is stopping the government from ever being involved in citizens talking about public issues. That's one view. The other view is that's important, but what's most important or equally important is making sure that the quality of that debate and discussion is sound and good. And we need to have the government also play a role in regulating some aspects of this so it can be a, a better system. What's an example? Well, in a courtroom, you have a jury. Nobody says that the jury can just hear whatever people want to say to it or ask whatever it wants, talk whatever it wants. There are rules. Lawyers can only introduce certain kinds of evidence. They can only say certain things, et cetera, because the thinking deliberative process requires that it be structured. When Jeff or I go teach our course on First Amendment, we don't just say it's open season. You can say anything you want. We say that's a good idea. That's not a good idea. You can't say that about this other person, et cetera. Should we have some of that in our political system. Well, campaign finance is playing out in one form. Another f area where this comes up is regulation of media. And in the United States, if you look over the past uh, 80, 90 years, there has been what I have called a dual system of the First Amendment with respect to media. Newspapers, New York Times, The Washington Post, etc. The government can't say, your editorial is unfair. You have to allow other sides to present their views. You can't just, you have too much power. You're the only newspaper in the city. I mean, you, you have to share the discussion with people who have other points of view. So your audience can hear all views. We say, absolutely not. Are you kidding? The government telling the New York Times what to publish? When it came to radio, and TV, and then cable to some extent, but radio and TV in the 1950s, 60s, 70s period. Very different regime. We set up a government agency, the Federal Communications Commission. It developed rules. If you were lucky enough to have a license and a monopoly position in your community, you have to present a fair debate. You have to allow people of different points of view to express themselves upheld unanimously by the Supreme Court in 1969. Dual system playing out these philosophical differences. So today, the question is Facebook. Is Facebook subject to government regulation because it is controlling the uh, uh, political forum in America? Or is it really like the New York Times? that it has total control over its content and the government can't intervene? Or is it a utility that has no particular First Amendment rights except uh, you know, we're, we're just going to regulate it like a, uh, a utility? This is one of the big questions as well. I mean, one of the reasons I think why this has become so complicated is that when most of the people in this room were growing up, uh, most Americans got their news from relatively reliable sources, um, whether it was uh, the New York Times or the Chicago Tribune or M ABC or NBC or whatever, um, we, most of us got our information and news from pe people who uh, did a serious, made a serious effort to make it well, accurate and, and fair. And they had positions. They had the the, the, the uh, Wall Street Journal was different from the New York Times, um, or the Nation was different from the National Review. Um, but they were basically responsible in presenting the facts and then made their arguments based on those facts. And they disagreed about the arguments, but it was pretty easy for people to have a reasonably reliable understanding in, on most issues of what the underlying facts are. Today, increasingly, people get their news and information from social media. And many of the sites that people rely upon, particularly younger people, um, are highly ideological in nature and screen their, uh, their quote, facts uh, to make them consistent with the set of views that they want to promote. 
And individuals who buy into that and get used to that as a norm uh, tend to think too often that this highly ideolo ideological source is giving me reliable facts. And it's difficult to have a well-functioning democracy if we have large percentages of the population with completely different beliefs about what the underlying facts are and are not open to even hearing the opposite side. And that's why the Fairness Doctrine came into being at the time it was created, because of the concern that when radio was invented, that you know, one or two very wealthy people would buy up the frequencies in a, in a particular city and just dominate it and, and put forth single points of view. So now we kind of face this problem, is that increasingly we have this tribalism that exists in, in American politics that, that was always there to some degree, but now seems to be there to a much greater degree. And how do we get people to understand that they need to be more self-critical about what they're learning and what they're hearing, and understand that there's a danger that they're only hearing one side of the, of the factual story, let alone the ideological story. Um, and that, I think, is, is the, the primary response to that, I think, should be educational. Um, it should be that we need, in, in literally the educational system for younger people, to be paying attention to informing them about the dangers of this world that they're now living in. And in the same way that we worry about teaching young people about crossing the street or using drugs or whatever, we need to teach them about being responsible citizens in a democracy, about how to inform themselves and how to be wary of the risks of becoming completely uh, dedicated to a particular uh, political or ideological point of view, which may be giving you false facts. Um, then there's a larger question of, can, do we want government to be regulating this? Do we trust government to get involved in regulating this? And there's a great danger in that, of course. Because, again, to put it in contemporary terms, do we want, for example, the Trump administration uh, to have the power to decide what is a false idea and what is not a false idea? And to have the power to punish those people who promulgate what they believe to be a false idea and to look the other way for those people who, uh, who advocate what they believe to be a true idea, whether it's in fact objectively true or not. So giving the government that power is dangerous in a democracy. It actually worked fairly well, I think, under the Fairness Doctrine, but it's not obvious that we can replicate that today in the world of social media. So <clears throat> you have campaign finance, and it plays out these big themes. You have uh, uh, the internet and new technologies of uh, communication like, and platforms like social media and what to do with them. It plays out this different uh, conceptions of the First Amendment. Um, these are nicely discussed in a series of essays, Emily Bell, Tim Wu, um, and um, uh, you know uh, what to do with Facebook and how to think about the internet, social media. Another area that is um, uh, a little different, it's, but it's extremely interesting, uh, is Pentagon Papers and the right of the press to publish uh, classified information. Uh, and uh, this, is a, this is an example, like social media is, we have this whole new communications technology, what do we do about it? How do we think about it? How do we spit it into our system of freedom uh, of speech and democracy? That's a new reality. How do we think about it? Pentagon Papers is, we figured this out, this problem. We have a solution. Have the circumstances changed such that we needed to invent, invent a new solution? So when Pentagon Papers came up in the 1970s, uh, the, the question was a, a question, an issue that every society has to face. A government must have the ability to operate in secret. I mean, you just, you know, it's insane to think that the government, everything about the government has to be open. So you have to acknowledge that we want a government that operates in secrecy. On the other hand, we know that governments are inclined to act too secretly. So they will overdo the secrecy part. How do you get that balance in the government where it's done too much and you need to reveal that to the public and it's doing the right amount and we don't need to have the public know? The press has built up over the past 100 years the idea, uh, we have built up the idea of the press as a kind of servant or actor for the public. We rely on the press uh, 
to get us information about the government. The press should be able to get the right amount of information from the government, even though it's classified, if it's overclassified, and get it to the public. So logically, you'd say, well, maybe there should be a judicial system where the press can go and it can say, this is overclassified, give it to us, we'll give it to the public, uh, or the government will, and the government will say, no, we need this, and, and some independent uh, body will adjudicate that. Absolutely uh, plausible idea. It simply uh, doesn't work. Uh, a, I mean, it has not uh, been accepted. What was accepted in Pentagon Papers was this highly ambiguous situation where the government can classify whatever it wants, and there's no right of the public or the press to get that through a judicial system. Leakers in the government <coughs> can take stuff, steal it from the government, and give it to the press. They run the risk of being prosecuted. They have no First Amendment right to claim because the public needs to know this. So they're at jeopardy. The press gets it maybe even knowing that the, it's been stolen and maybe even acting with the, the leaker to some extent in getting this. They then decide how much is truly public and should be public, how much. There's a war. That's the way it's been described, a battle. Now today you have Snowden and you have WikiLeaks and you have computers and you have masses of information that can be released. Jeff has been, was on Obama's task force to think about this. He's deeply knowledgeable about this problem. The question in a nutshell is, we could trust the Washington Post and the New York Times in 1970 whatever to make a sound, good, intelligent, wise judgment about publishing this and not publishing that. Ellsworth had to go and Xerox every damn page of the Pentagon Papers. He knew what was in there. Um, today, it's Julian Assange and WikiLeaks who could care less about America. They're not patriots in any sense. They have no judgment about what it is that's wise to release and not. <coughs> and somebody with the push of a computer, of a button on a computer, can release millions of documents, and they have no idea what's in them. Does that mean that we now should have a different regime for this? And that's one of the open questions. Um, one of the other issues worth talking about, which is also discussed in the book, is the question of hate speech, um, where the United States has a position that is different from many Western democracies. Um, many Western democracies have laws against hate speech. Um, and attempt to prohibit it. Um, the United States uh, Supreme Court in 1951, um, at a time when First Amendment protection was relatively thin still in this country, um, held essentially that laws against hate speech were constitutional in the United States. Um, the same time that they were holding that members of the Communist Party could be put in jail um, for espous espousing their views. So it was kind of a low point in First Amendment protection. But in the years since then, the court has, uh, both liberal and conservative justices, have unanimously come to the opposite conclusion and have said that there cannot be a doctrine that uh, prohibits the, the publication or the espousal of what others might call hate speech. And the reason the court has come to that view is because it has basically embraced a principle that says that government may not restrict speech because of the point of view or the ideas being expressed. That we simply do not trust government to decide for us what are good and bad ideas. And if we, if we give the government the authority to make those judgments, then they will abuse that authority inevitably. And we, the justices, don't want the power to decide which ideas the government should be allowed to suppress and which ideas they shouldn't be allowed to suppress, because we too are vulnerable to our own biases and our own um, uh, uh, ideologies. So the court has basically endorsed as a very strict rule that the government may not restrict speech because the particular point of view being expressed by the individual um, 
is seen as undesirable or hurtful unless that speech can be shown to create, at the very least, a clear and present danger of grave harm. Um, and that's a standard that the Supreme Court has actually never, in the last half century, has never found to be satisfied in any case. Um, it's that demanding a standard. And so with hate speech, the government says, we don't see any principled way to treat hate speech differently from any other speech that other people may hate. And it may be hurtful, but lots of speech is hurtful. It may cause harm. Lots of speech causes harm, like the World War I speech did, in fact, cause harm. Um, but we don't think government should be in the business of picking and choosing what ideas are, are prohibitable. This is one area where American law is very different from that in many other Western democracies. And what, what Americans who defend that position would say is that we have learned from our own mistakes. And that having attempted to have a constitutional guarantee of free speech and to be rigorous about protecting it, we have learned we can't trust ourselves. And therefore, we have to bend over backwards to tolerate things that the majority of us may think are horrible. Um, European countries haven't had a tradition of free speech in a constitutional sense for very long. Most of them have moved in that direction only relatively recently. They haven't learned yet how they're going to screw up, and what dangers they create when they start picking and choosing what speech they can decide is prohibitable. And we'll see what happens with that. I mean, it may be a problem uh, of the sort that, that I just identified. Maybe it'll work out just fine. Um, but in, in this sense, I think there's a very unanimous and rigorous commitment to the principle here, really beginning with the Skokie case involving the Nazis marching in Skokie, uh, where the court has come to the view that we just can't allow uh, the majority to pick and choose what ideas they find uh, don't have value. Um, because for lots of ideas we once thought didn't have value. Abortion should be legal. Gays should have rights. Uh, uh, interracial marriage should be a constitutional right. Those are things which would have been regarded as completely off the charts in the past. And only because we allowed those ideas to be expressed and allowed people to address them and think about them, we changed our minds. And we don't think that the majority or the court should have the authority to decide which ideas are off the table and which are not. Because if we'd done that in the past, we'd be a worse society today than we are. So this is, um, <clears throat> this is uh, really an important subject. Obviously, everybody in this room has been part of discussions, read things. You know, have we taken free speech in America too far? And are we protecting people who are hurting others and undermining the culture of decency in, uh, in the country. Uh, what Jeff, just to sort of describe Jeff, Jeff is the leading person in the First Amendment um, uh, group of uh, scholars over the past uh, 50 years, who has most articulated and refined this uh, idea that we need an analytical framework for thinking about uh, attempts to censor uh, speech. And that framework is if the government is trying to regulate a viewpoint or content of the speech, it's, it's done. We're not going to allow that. But if it's trying to do other things and there's this kind of, it's not a, intending to stop ideas or, okay, that kind of difference is extremely important and has been absolutely the defining kind of framework for First Amendment uh, thinking. Uh, and, and as I said, very complex. And Jeff's articles and books about this are, are brilliant. Um, I take a little bit different view on this and, and um, a little um, uh, sort of, I don't know, airier view, I suppose. It's hard to describe. I think the, the, the thing that has always fascinated me about uh, this phenomena in American jurisprudence of protecting uh, extremist speech or hate speech or so, is um, several things. I mean, as important to note, as Jeff says, the United States stands alone in the world and in human history in the degree to which this kind of speech is protected. So uh, this is uh, an historic choice and an experiment in a way. So every other modern democracy uh, draws that line closer in on ter against uh, extremist speech, and it's sort of hard to say that um, you know that these other democracies are 
not democracies because they do. There's something going on here that uh, uh, I think one has to unravel. So for me, uh, I start with the idea that the First Amendment has been more than just a line setting operation for when the government can regulate in speech or not. It is such a powerful set of cases and ideas and theories and so on that it has become part of the American identity. If you ask Americans, what does it mean to be American? One of the things that will be said right away is we believe in freedom of speech and press and openness. And people have different views about this. And it's an astonishing thing uh, to sort of see how an idea can seep in and define a culture. You ask Europeans, what does it mean to be French? And what does it mean to be? They don't go right away to freedom of speech and press. But for us, openness and so on. And part of that plays out in the context of protecting really nasty, bad speech. There's some kind of almost pride in us as a society being able to tolerate that. The judges always say, this is horrible speech. We totally disagree and condemn this content. Quite unique, actually, because judges you know, shouldn't be sort of commenting on this, but they do in the hate speech. That's why when Trump said, there are good people on both sides of that, that was a public official changing the dynamics of what is happening in protection of speech. Because the, in order for us to protect extremist hate speech, we have to all agree, basically. That's horrible. But then there's something in, we're, we're a society that believes that we have problems in accepting ideas. And in this realm of freedom of speech, we're going to, as Jeff said, bend over backwards to allow even the worst people, the worst ideas, Nazism, Holocaust, et cetera, we're going to accept uh, their right to speak because we are confident that we can counter this and so on. Other societies um, don't. In Germany, you cannot publish Mein Kampf. You cannot promote Nazism. And you understand why German society would go that route and why America might take a different route. But a fascinating area. Now, do you want to open up questions? Yeah, Jeff and I agreed beforehand that we would only speak for 15 minutes and open it up for questions, <laughs> but we liked hearing ourselves so much <laughs> that we gave ourselves an extra 20 minutes. Well, I, I can't tell you how grateful we are for this brilliant illumination of the First Amendment. So thank you very much. It was like having our own private tutorial. So um, I just ask that when I call on you to introduce yourself and just uh, make your question short. So that we get everybody. And let to us just say, we have other people in the room uh, who are our colleagues uh, who also have a lot of um, knowledge. And uh, Jerry Rosberg here was a co clerk with Jeff and uh, me at the same year. And sort of that was a formation of all of this. He worked for the Washington Post for 20 years, knows this world deeply. David Stone worked for PBS and so on. They've been in communications with us. And Jamil. Jaffer is the head of our Knight Institute at Columbia, which is a major effort uh, on our part and the, and the um, Knight Foundation to actually try to do both foster debate, research, and uh, litigate uh, about this. And uh, Judith Miller as well. Yeah. Well, I hope you all will ask a question, right? So um, if you have one, raise your hand, and I'll be sure to call on you. So we'll just start over here, um, this gentleman here in the black jacket. Uh, what, excuse me, just in, oh. please introduce yourself. Uh, my name is John Wallach. I'm a political theorist. Um, thank you very much for your comments on uh, free speech. I'd like you to elaborate, however, on uh, something that you didn't talk about, and that is that free speech is never just about words. Free speech is about the effect it plays in a social context, as you mentioned with respect to Germany. And so when it comes to campaign finance or hate speech or any of these other things, it's never a matter of someone being for speech, free speech or someone being against free speech. It's a matter of judges and lawyers making a judgment, a political judgment, about the effect of that speech on the political environment. And I wonder if you could address that with respect to uh, 
uh, questions of campaign finance, for example, which doesn't involve the government, which you've concentrated on, but about corporations and about their ability to regulate speech or about hate groups like in Charlottesville, the ACLU was divided about whether or not to issue um, protection for the demonstrators. And uh, is, is there a way to integrate the notion of context for free speech into our free speech thinking? You know, you campaign finance and then I'll do them. Because you're... Uh, I'm not actually sure exactly what, what you mean by uh, context in the in this setting. Um, uh, I think that, that what in, in interpreting the First Amendment, I think for the most part what, what the court has learned over time is that <clears throat> it, it wants to the greatest extent possible to divorce the decisions of judges from the specifics of a, of, a, of, a, of a specific context. Because in that, when they do that, they run the risk of being <coughs> unduly influenced by their own subjective values and rooting interests and political beliefs and so on. And so one of the aspirations, I think, of First Amendment doctrine uh, that the court has moved towards over time is to adopt what are basically neutral principles about how to think about and how to apply the First Amendment that takes away the ability of even the judges to be influenced subjectively by their own rooting interests for one side or the other. And so in that sense, I think it becomes a contextual in that they don't want it to be influenced by whether we like these speakers or we don't like these speakers. And, and therefore, they try to rise above that by creating principles that, that don't open the door to those kinds of circumstances. Um, one area where I think the, the justices haven't quite figured out how to do that is campaign finance, where I, where I do think you see the strong ideological partisan division among the justices, which is if you asked, if you asked would, you, would you expect Republicans to be in favor of campaign finance or Democrats, right, just as a political matter, right, all of you, I think, would say, well, we expect Democrats would want to have campaign finance, not Republicans, mainly because most billionaires are, are supporting Republicans. And, um, and, and on that issue, the fact that all the Republican-appointed justices tend to be uh, against campaign finance regulation and Democratic justices are in favor of it is an example. They would reject this, of course, but it's an example where one might say that justices are not rising, uh, rising above the political implications of a situation and figuring out how to be truly neutral about it. But for the most part, that's the aspiration. And, and that's why I think the justices try very hard to create principles which enable them and require them, in effect, to be separate from their own rooting interest in any given case. So I would say, um, and I'm also unclear about where uh, exactly you were going, but uh, it raises for me, uh, your comments, uh, another kind of deep puzzle about freedom of speech and press First Amendment. And that is, and all of us have wrestled with this, uh, why are we so attuned to stopping government involvement in the area of speech or human expression? And, and you know, then you've got to say, well, what do we mean by speech? Because everything is communication. You know, how are we going to cut this off uh, as a concept? Lots of intellectual puzzles in that direction. The court came up with a kind of uh, set of lines. But the profound problem remains, whatever you call speech, why are we giving all this attention to this area of human activity and not all the other parts? What's, what's going on with this? And you can start to say, um, well, you know, speech doesn't cause as much harm as <laughs> other forms of human action. Therefore, well, you know, is that a justification? It may be true. But is that a justification for all the uh, things we're talking about? You can also say, actually, it causes a lot more harm in lots of ways than the other forms of it. So you, now you have uh, another part. Or you can say, we have, for a variety of historical, cultural contexts, language of the Constitution, historical writings of famous people like Milton and Mill, we came to the idea for, you know, maybe not rational reasons, but that this area of human activity deserves more kind of uh, protection against government than other forms. 
And then one might say, it, it's actually because we want to have an area where we play out this kind of thinking because it will have an impact, a positive impact, in the other areas. So I often like the analogy of wilderness, uh, natural wilderness. I mean, why do, we, why do we want to live in New York City and then go into the back country of Yosemite? We're trying to, you know, maybe it's fun, maybe it's just a break and so on, but there's all, usually something more. We're trying to develop our character, our values, our capacities in certain ways. And then we come back into society and we think we're better. I think there's something about that in the protections of speech and the way we go about it uh, with the rest of human activity. But, you know. Uh, just wait for the microphone, please. Okay. <coughs> I'm Judy Miller, and I'm a journalist. And I'm not going to ask a shield law question. <laughs> uh, you write about Facebook, and by the way, thank you very much for the book and, and for your, your work. But you write about Facebook, Google. Uh, I've spent the last year looking at the impact of those uh, social media platforms on newspapers. And I can tell you that if the current trends continue, we won't have any newspapers left in a decade. They, you won't have to worry about whether or not the New York Times and the Washington Post are responsible, because they won't be there if, uh, if things continue. You say that it's difficult, if not impossible, to, uh, or perhaps not advisable, to regulate Facebook, Google through free speech laws or restrictions. But what about using antitrust laws, where it's no longer the government that journalists are afraid of in terms of restrictions or are primarily afraid of. It's being not even given a platform to have your articles and your ideas expressed. Because Google and Facebook are very close to being in a monopolistic position to do just that. And have started to do that by limiting content with which they find unacceptable. So can one, should one explore the idea of using antitrust laws as opposed to getting at them through free speech. Why should Facebook not be uh, regulated by the same defamation and libel laws that apply to the New York Times? So big, big and important question. Jeff, do you want to go no, first? Go <laughs> so, so first of all, I, I don't want to, uh, I, I want to correct a misimpression. I did not take a position that Facebook should not be regulated. And, um, I do have a sort of tentative position on this, uh, uh, but um, it's, it's more complex than, than that. So we are in a period of absolutely profound historic transition in uh, what we think of as, quote, journalism and the press, universities, and so on. Um, I grew up in a family that um, uh, worked at, owned a small daily newspaper in a small town in America, spent my whole life in this, uh, in this arena. Um, uh, so I feel I know it uh, well and painfully well. Uh, it is a tragedy in America to see the decline of the press uh, as we've known it. It's a, it's a tragedy. Uh, it's unclear exactly how it will play out. We know right now that uh, a private uh, enterprise can't keep a major institution like the Washington Post going, and that the only way is to have it fall into the hands of a very, very, very wealthy person uh, for whom the price of the paper is uh, the equivalent of what his portfolio goes up or down in a single day. Um, we know that uh, local and uh, regional uh, press and journalism has been devastated by this quite. So the New York Times, Washington Post continue, but uh, uh, we know that there are so many examples of local newspapers. Meanwhile, we have this new technology, and they are deeply conflicted about how they want to be thought about. On the one hand, they want to be a utility. We just let everything out there. We're not responsible for anything. And Congress gave them that protection in the 1990s. On the other hand, they are <laughs> under enormous pressure to censor, to stop. I mean, the, the, some people think they censor too much. Other people say you're not censoring enough. You're allowing Russians to meddle. You're allowing other people to spread work. It, it, so there's t a criticism of too much censorship, a criticism of too little censorship, 
and, uh, and a view that it's changing us. Not just that it's uh, letting in a certain amount of speech and uh, shouldn't be uh, uh, you know, their choice. It's that we are becoming different people because of the interactions on this. So we're becoming more isolated in our exposure to other viewpoints. We're becoming short term in our ability to think about things. Uh, this is, these are, these are of the most significant questions a country faces. It goes to the thought and the information we deal with. Many things to say about this. One of the reasons I raised the broadcasting example is because I think it's within the First Amendment tradition to conceive of a government role of participating in the development of these uh, organizations. Uh, I'm not there yet because I still want to see how uh, the technology companies themselves deal with this and change. I want to see them develop, they can develop a journalistic ethos in the way that the print media did and the broadcast media. I mean, when I was growing up, my father, who ran a newspaper, was a publisher, editor of a newspaper, would never accept the idea that a broadcaster was an editor or a journalist. I mean, it was unacceptable to have that. And then broadcasting developed that ethos over time. What will happen with Facebook and these other? Jeff says, rightly, we need to try some other things first, like education, like, um, I would add, we need to think about public funding of journalism. So I've written about, I mean, not one of the privileges of being an academic is you can come up with ideas that ab have absolutely no possibility of ever <laughs> happening. And I think, you know, to take, BB, to take uh, NPR and PBS and to develop our own American equivalent of BBC would be a fantastic thing. Uh, the journalism school, um, uh, as you uh, know, and Nick Lemon, uh, Nick likes to say that he and I are the only human beings in the United States who have advocated for public funding of classic journalism. Uh, but most journalists regard that as anathema, just like uh, most politicians do. Just two quick points. I mean, one is I do think that the idea of public funding um, is increasingly important and attractive going forward. Um, but it has to be done in a very careful way. Because once again, if government has the power to fund uh, journalism, then the danger is that whoever's got the power to decide who they're going to fund, they're going to do it in ways that are politically um, and ideologically consistent with their own views. So one has to figure out how to do that in a way that's truly neutral. Um, that's not impossible, but it's a serious challenge. Um, the, the, the second point I, I guess I'd make is that um, one way that to deal in part with some of the problems about, about Facebook or other social media um, in terms of government regulation is to have government, for example, require that whenever an individual um, reads a, a, a site or, uh, on, on, on social media, of a particular ideological point of view, that they are automatically then given an alternative uh, opposite position. It's kind of like a fairness doctrine to the individual. So that at least people are automatically given the opposing mm -hmm. view. They don't have to read it. You can't require them to read it. Right. But at least to make sure they're aware of it and they see it. And you can do that with these algorithms. Yeah. Um, and I think that's one way of, of, of enhancing the opportunities that people have to not become completely tribal in their, in their social media yeah. activity. I mean, let me just say one other thing. Um, so it's so uh, easy to convey the wrong impression. I think it's fantastic what has happened to the Washington Post uh, under uh, its new ownership. I mean, uh, Don Graham and the Graham family are legends in the in the journalistic uh, field, and and should be legends in how that transition happened. Uh, but the, uh, the strengthening of the Washington Post is one of the great uh, stories of the past decade, I think. Gentleman over here. Um, okay, so could, could you just wait time. until the microphone comes to you and introduce yourself, please? Jamil Jaffer, I run the Knight Institute at, at Columbia. Uh, and, and Lee is the chair of my board, so my question can be only so, so robust and uninhibited. <laughs> um, but, but I wanted to ask both of you about um, your thoughts about national security secrets and the First Amendment. So Lee, you suggested that 
Uh, we are now living in a different era in which technology gives leakers the ability to disclose a lot of information at once. Um, maybe the actors that are publishing this information aren't as reliable or trustworthy as the actors who were publishing it 50 years ago. Um, it seems to me that we paid a very high price for excessive secrecy over the last 20 years. Uh, and I can point to specific examples, and I'm sure others here could point to others, but I'll, I'll let me just point to a couple, right? You know, so one is the Bush administration's interrogation policies, the torture policies. Yeah. I think there's a very good argument that if the Office of Legal Counsel hadn't been able to keep secret the memos that authorized those policies, the public wouldn't have accepted those policies, and the public rejected them when they were disclosed. Um, it's a very good argument that the war in Iraq was made possible by excessive secrecy, or at least in part by excessive secrecy. So we've paid a very high price. You know, Jeff was involved with the President's Review, review Group, uh, which looked into the, the, the surveillance policies uh, that were disclosed by, by Snowden. And I think there's a good argument that some of what the FISA court approved would never have been approved if the debates had been public. And in fact, after the documents became public, the public and Congress rejected some of the policies. So I think there's good evidence that we've paid a high price for excessive secrecy. And on the other side, um, it's obvious that publishers sometimes publish things they shouldn't publish, right? They're not in the national interest or in the public interest. Um, Julian Assange published the diplomatic cables and they embarrassed a lot of people. Maybe at the margin they made it more difficult for the United States to accomplish what it wanted to accomplish overseas. Uh, the New York Times published the Sony hacks, which mm -hmm. embarrassed a lot of people, uh, invaded privacy unnecessarily, uh, or at least one could argue. Um, but it's not obvious to me that the cost of excessive transparency, uh, or anywhere near the cost of excessive secrecy. Um, and so I'm curious to know whether you, you, know, you disagree with that, um, and you know, Jeff in particular, because you, you, you had this experience working with the uh, President's Review Group on Surveillance, whether you disagree with that. Because it, it seems to me that it's perhaps dangerous to think about uh, changing the system now in a way that would close up uh, our debates even more than they are closed right now. Yeah. Uh, so I, I, I agree that there is dramatic overclassification. Um, that, that's one problem. One problem is that, that, that either because individuals within the government want to keep things secret because they're politically controversial, and therefore they, they will stamp it top secret, even though it's not really a threat to the national security who was disclosed, but they'll, they'll classify it because they have political interest involved. Um, but also because if you're the individual involved in classifying any particular bit of information, uh, if you overclassify something, you don't pay any price. If you don't classify something that should have been classified, and it gets public, and it's really bad, you're screwed. And so all of the incentive is to overclassify, both legitimate, understandable motivations and also not appropriate political motivations. And so there's huge overclassification. And one question, is there any way to, to realistically monitor that? And part of the problem is there's so much information that's classified that trying to actually go through it document by document is almost in, it's an insurmountable challenge. Uh, but that's, that's one part of the problem. Uh, the other part of the problem, however, is that there is information which, if made public, really does harm the national interest and really does need to be kept secret. And one doesn't want to be casual about that. And the difficulty is we don't have a very good way of sorting out which is which inside the government structure. Um, so if you, you talk about Snowden, some of the information that Snowden revealed, in my view, um, was not harmful to the national security, was useful in terms of it led to reforms of certain policies that should have been reformed and wouldn't have been reformed but for those leaks. And that was a positive development. But other things that he released, in my judgment, did serious damage to national security and did not result in any reforms at all, um, other than the fact that the policies became ineffective because of the leaks. So it's very difficult to make evaluations of these things. Um, and my view is we need much greater internal uh, regulation within the government itself, that we need much greater surveillance, not surveillance, oversight of what gets classified and what doesn't get classified that now exists. 
And it has to be done by people who are objective and not deeply embedded within that we have to keep everything secret. Um, and one thing I discovered, even from my short stint of six months inside this world, is that once you get inside this world and you begin to see the vulnerabilities of disclosing information, it's easy to become overly cautious very quickly. And so it's hard to have people who are going to be neutral and dispassionate in making these evaluations once they begin to feel the pressure of, I don't want to make a mistake. Right? So it's a really hard one. But clearly what we need to do, what we haven't done, is to put in place mechanisms to review classification inside the government um, by people who are much more neutral and detached. And I think what that means is they have to be turned over regularly. So you have new people coming in on a regular basis. So, so very quickly, because we're running out of time, but Jamil has laid out, again, beautifully the, the kind of uh, the, the costs that we pay for secrecy and um, uh, on public information that's needed and the costs of too much uh, being disclosed. There are several points of entry on the Pentagon Papers. One is you can say uh, we, should have, we should go back and we should correct the constitutional decisions that say the press has no right of access to information. We should open up a constitutional right of journalism to demand of the government that things be released and the judges will weigh the classified interests, uh, classified scrutiny, and the, and the benefits of openness. We need a greater access. The court was wrong to shut down a right of access. Another way to go would be to give constitutional protection to leakers to some degree. So right now, if you're going to be a leaker, you, you don't have any First Amendment claim, and you may well go to jail. So it's a big calculation for you. Maybe we should have a balance that allows that to uh, weigh the benefits and costs. The last is that we shouldn't abandon Pentagon Papers, but we should draw a distinction between the WikiLeaks of the world, which really are not responsible organizations, let's say, and the major press institutions of America. A lot of people don't like that because they don't want to get into the business of your good uh, press and your bad press, uh, but it may be that the best way to get this is to uh, begin to make that distinction. So there are a lot of ways in which to rebalance. Well, thank you again for giving this wonderful opportunity. And although this was just a tasting, this is a full meal. So I encourage you to buy the book and really read it. It's just a wonderful background to have. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.